Hey, everybody, want to see an embarrassing photo? Yeah, look, he doesn't even know how stupid he looks. Being Bethesda is being suffering. You're always working on a port of Skyrim at any given moment, even if you don't realize it. You have to live with the fact that you can't pay people to forget you did a Fallout 76, and the release window for every game you're currently working on has to replace the two in the current year with a three. Go ahead. Pick one. <laughs> Bethesda's been taking its licks for these past couple years, going down with the other two big bees in Blizzard and Bioware as the companies that could do no wrong now can do no right. The halcyon days of Elder Scrolls 4, Fallout 3, and Dishonored are gone, and now I don't really know what they're planning to do right now. However, no amount of overpriced microtransactions, unnecessary ports, and delayed games will ever top the one biggest embarrassment in the entire history of Bethesda's life. See, Bethesda owns a lot of things, and in order to keep making things, they have to have other people work on their stuff. That's why id makes the Doom games. You ever notice the Doom games were good? Sometimes they even lend out one of their flagship series to a different developer. That's what happened in 2010 when Obsidian Games took the reins for an odd experiment on paper. It was a new Fallout game! Kind of. See, Bethesda and Obsidian had been in talks for years about making a game that was more so Fallout 3 More Edition rather than Fallout 4. Obsidian itself was made up of former employees of Black Isle Studios, who were made up of former employees from Interplay. Plugging this into 23andMe was so hard. So it was kind of like finally getting to see your baby again after so long, and that gave them the drive to do it right. That drive drove them directly off a cliff as they saw the 18-month development cycle they just got saddled with. Okay, okay, that's fine, it's fine, we just gotta make the game and- Oh, what now? Well, that would be the game engine they were working on. Gamebryo had been Bethesda's old reliable, using it for years and years on plenty of games, and they were just trying to ignore the little quirk that it was a 10 plus year old game engine. Not to mention the fact that six months of that 18 month development cycle was just spent trying to figure out how the game would work. Whatever. Fine, so we just gotta learn how to walk again. Great. At least the game's gonna be done so we can- Huh? Yes, this fat boy had to drop on multiple SKUs, including the notorious sixth generation bad boy, the PS3. Those who didn't know how to work on its needlessly complicated hardware were in for a rough, rough time. So on top of a PC and Xbox release, you also gotta tame the banana boy too. I was actually hoping something horrible would happen to me soon. Awesome, can we get any worse? All the DLC out in a year? Yes, before the game even got to blow out a single candle on its birthday cake, they had to get all four of their massive DLC expansions up and out of the house before the new shiny boy Skyrim got to come in and fart on the carpets. And now, despite all those restrictions, and despite the fact that people really like to spread the lie that Bethesda was the whip-cracking madman throughout development, despite the fact that they also kind of screwed the developers out of a big pay bonus, but that's a different story for a different time, Obsidian coughed up a game on October 19th, 2010. Now, remember that embarrassing little secret that I mentioned earlier? Well, this is it. Bethesda didn't even make the best 3D Fallout game. Fallout New Vegas is one of the most fun, engaging, and replayable Western RPGs, let alone games ever made. Bethesda's tried to one-up them since, and whoops, but nothing seems to beat New Vegas. Sorry there's no mystery as to whether or not I like this, I just... Look, this is how much time I've clocked into the game in the past two or so years. This doesn't even come close to my actual playtime. I love New Vegas so much. So much that I wanted to make a video on it. Except that's really, really hard. This is a long game, and I don't know if I can really do it justice without taking you step by step through my whole playthrough. So this video is going to be a little bit different than usual. This is part review of Fallout New Vegas, part video journal of my time spent patrolling the Mojave. Buckle up, kids. This is gonna be a long one. When booting the game up, you get this... 18-month development cycle animation, which shows us slowly leaving the warm embrace of the sin of New Vegas into the harsh, cold reality of the wastelands. We're in a bit of a stickity wicket as we're on the business end of Benny. Benny is voiced by actual human Matthew Perry. You may know him for just barely missing the Kids' Choice Awards in 2002 and some other stuff, I guess. So he and his goofy sidekicks, the Great Cons, are nicking a package we were delivering and plan on doing something nasty with it. As the world's most dedicated UPS driver, we try to stop him, but... 
I'll get him next time. After a brief nap, we wake up in the reliable hands of Doc Mitchell. I feel so safe knowing this man touched my brain sponge. He asks us our name, and I decide I want an air of authority when I play this game, so I name myself Mr. President. However, when building my character, I wanted to keep him guessing, so I made Mr. President a woman. The character creator is... It's really rough. You have to dig around for a while to try to make something that isn't a disgusting freak with more chins than most people have fingers. Next up is the Vigor Tester. Here we get to allocate all our core skills. Strength, Perception, Endurance, Charisma, Intelligence, Agility, and Luck. Special! Mr. President is one tough cookie and everybody likes them, but they have no idea what's going on at any given moment and even if they did, they'd be too stupid to understand. These all affect your later traits, so it's best to know what you want going in. After that, Doc asks us some questions to determine our tag skills. Through these questions, the game assigns you a tag to one of these Baker Dozens worth of attributes. That makes you naturally really proficient at the skill and gives you a head start for later in the game. Doc Mitchell thinks I like hitting things with my fists, but I have to inform him I much prefer hitting them with bullets. Finally is your perks. Here's where the real customization begins. Here you pick from a list of several modifiers that all have upsides and downsides for you to start out with. You get them every other level up and unlock more as you reach certain thresholds in your skills. Of them, I pick Trigger Discipline because you don't need to fire a second shot when you kill him with one, and Wild Wasteland because I gotta make this video interesting. After Doc gives me clothes, I was wearing clothes when you found me, and giving us the option of Hardcore Mode, which no thank you, I bruise easy, we're up and out of there. Yeah, the intro's over now. By this point in the rest of these games, we'd just be getting to the inciting incident. I think the advantage New Vegas has is that it lets you play as a character who isn't new to Fallout. Mr. President has lived in the wastelands a long time, so she doesn't need to get caught up. At the same time, the player who probably played Fallout 3 doesn't need to be caught up on how to play. It's a short, snappy intro that gives me a rush of nostalgia every time Doc asks me if he did a good job putting my face back together. So I stumble forward, slippery and scared, and I head over to the town shop to see what I can afford with my bottle cap collection. Apparently nothing. If I had upped my barter skill, I might be able to haggle the price, but as it is, I'm up a creek. I try to sell this hat I stole from Doc, but it's worth so little to him that he doesn't even offer me any money. It's worth less than worthless. A new enemy is made, and I decide to drown my sorrows at the bar. I can't afford any of the booze, I'm just hoping the toilet works. There we meet Sunny Smiles, and she offers to teach me the ropes of being a person who doesn't get shot in the face by Benny. She gifts us a varmint rifle and takes us up, down, and all around creation as we learn about cooking, which requires survival, another skill I have no idea how to use, and introduces us to combat. You click on the enemy, and they die. Some guns make them die quicker. Some guns shoot green and red, making them Christmas. Some guns are knives. All of you gotta subscribe if I hit this shot down there. After asserting my dominance on Sunny Smile, she sends me off to go find ingredients to make healing powder, which I'm going to need a lot of if I keep fighting like a loner in a barbershop quartet. Game crashes. Here's where we also get to see VATS. You freeze time and can aim at a specific limb to fire on, even shoot the weapon out of somebody's hands. This is their compromise for the fact that Fallout isn't turn-based anymore, and let me tell you, there is no more satisfying mechanic than VATS. Getting to blow somebody's head off or cripple a limb never stops being satisfying. Alright, all of Sunny's chores are done and dusted, and this bum is trying to hassle the lady who works the counter! Hey, Bob, you got a problem with her? You talk to me! Well, it seems he doesn't have a problem with any of us, just the guy they're stowing away in the gas station. Well, I'm sure we can all resolve this in a nice, calm, orderly fashion. Just kind of invite myself in and- ah! White boy jump scare! Ringo tells us that Joe Cobb, the leader of the Powder Gangers, is gonna give him an atomic wedgie and asks us to help! Well, after practicing on these tumbleweeds, I think I'm ready! Hey, beat it, bozo! <laughs> Uh, I guess you could say he got the point. <laughs> uh, it doesn't really work with guns. Turns out I was about to level up and Joe was just enough XP. Now I get to put my points into whatever skills I want and pick out a shiny new perk. I picked the perk that lets you kiss women. That's right, Mr. President is a lesbian representation. I go back to Ringo and tell him the good news about how many pieces Joe Cobb's head is in. Despite doing a great job and everybody liking me, people think I made the wrong choice, which is wrong because I'm right. I recruit Sunny Smiles to take on the rest of Joe's gang and attempt to get Easy Pete on my side. I failed and successfully got Trudy the bar lady and Doc Mitchell's his help. Chet is a wimp and should die, but doesn't because he has money I want, but I gotta get it legally. After telling Ringo that Chet wets the bed, Sunny tells us the powder gangers are here to play. 
so bad that the game crashes and I only remember to start recording after the fight is already over. Something awful must have happened here. I fleece Chet for every stupid cap he's worth and set out on that dusty trail. I gotta find Benny and make him pay for making my brain not work too good no more. He's in New Vegas, so I gotta get to New Vegas. Now, at the Fork Roads of Destiny, I could either take the left path and get a pile driver from a death claw, or I could take the right path and take the long way around. After weighing my options, Leave me alone, it's my birthday! You can't hit the birthday boy! I decide to take the long way around. I also get to try out my new shotgun and realize I have been missing this my whole life. My first stop on my journey is to Prim. This town looks locked down tight, so I gotta be careful when I- Hey, where the hell do you think you're going? Prim is off limit. Sorry, did you just tell Mr. President what to do? I'll show you. I'll take your ammo right out from under your noses. <laughs> you may have noticed a little indicator saying I lost karma. Well, in this game, the more good or bad you do, the higher or lower your karma goes. This will change how people treat you, if good or bad things happen to you, and generally dictate if you have a good or bad time. Stealing and killing innocents loses you karma while stealing important things and killing bad people gives you good karma. No way that could be misinterpreted. You can also check to see what your karma is at any time as well you're standing with major factions. As you can see, I'm basically the queen of the powder gangers. After acquiring baseball technology and bashing the heads in of some escaped convicts, I decide to see what the deal in Prim is and my game crashes. When I eventually make it inside, I find Johnson, my boss from the trading post. He says he doesn't have any work for me right now and I inform him that's fine, I'm on a revenge mission to paint the town red with Benny's skull. To get more information on where to go next, I gotta find Beagle, but Beagle isn't here, he's trapped in the Bison Steve Hotel across the street. No big deal, open the door, game crash, and I crash my band to the heads of everybody inside! Except when they start playing unfair and kill me instead. Dude, when he comes around the corner, this is gonna be such a good prank. April Fools, it's live ammunition! After a few more attempts, I get it on my first try and free Beagle! Not before stealing the clothes off his back and giving him a slap on the keister to go home while I clear out the rest of the building. Dude, watch me kill this guy in one shot. One shot. One shot. One shot. With a 95% chance hit missing, I decided to go hell for leather and try using a submachine gun to mow down everybody coming for me. This works so well, it crashes the game. I finish with the infestation and go back to Good Springs to sell all my ill-gotten gains to Chet. I could have gone somewhere else and gotten more for it, but I don't want the world, I just want Chet's part of it. I decided to go visit my people at the Powder Ganger's headquarters when I am stopped by this freak show named Malcolm who has somehow been following me closely enough to notice the details of the bottle caps I've been taking. He says one of them is a special star bottle cap and it's worth something. Well, he must know from experience. After attempting to fight a mountain in the game crashing, I make my way to the correctional facility the gang lives at. This is one of the big nests of enemies dotted all around the map. The hotel is one, but this is way more heavily guarded and puts the advantage firmly in the Powder Ganger's territory. After taking out the guard in a watchtower and trying to shoot a man I'm not even sure is real, I go into the first room with the maximum effort. Mr. President realizes that you can only be filled with so many bullets until it stops being a problem as she calmly walks forward and gets a grand slam on the whole room of Powder Ganger heads. I level up and realize that putting the bullets in bullet end first can load my gun way quicker. After the slaughter, Myers, you know, Myers comes in and strikes up a very casual conversation despite the fact that he has to move one of his dead friends off the chair he wants to sit down in. It's probably not a good sign when the game tells me that specifically this guy has died. He wasn't the president, was he? Mr. President's big day out continues as she takes five bad pistols and turns them into one good pistol with duct tape and a can-do attitude. It's after innocently blowing a man's arm into another postal code that I also start earning points towards a challenge. There are tons of challenges that give you bonus XP for completing certain tasks in the game. The fact that it says GRA means that it's Gunrunners. Gunrunners Arsenal is one of the DLCs that instead of adding a new map to play in, gives you a whole ton of new weapons to play with and challenges to complete. The only DLC I don't have is the Courier's Stash, which is just super easy mode and gives you a bunch of items to start out the game with. So armed with God's strongest soldier, a lead pipe, I proceed into the main building and realize maybe I'd do better if they only had pipes too, but they have guns, so I decide to set a trap with my fragile body. I gather them all into to one spot and blow him to kingdom come with a grenade I found. Then I happily pick off the stragglers with my pipe. I hit one guy so hard in the head that his leg explodes and the powder gangers are history. What's important to remember is that it's on site with powder gangers and I'm morally right for doing this. I steal ammo for guns I don't even own and how to my next stop, Nipton. Oh yeah, Mr. Door? Well, I don't think I like your tone. I, I 
was trying to make a funny joke that would make any cute girls watching laugh, and you ruined it, you sons of I run into this video's arachnophobia warning as apparently nuclear radiation has turned exoskeletons into Kevlar. I cannot handle these scorpions and run up an entire hill so they stop bullying me. At the top, there happens to be an outpost for the New California Republic, or NCR. These were the people that a mere bottom of the helico were trying to tell me what to do, so I'm extremely distrusting of them, especially after they crashed my game. However, I decide to do them a favor since I am, of course, the de facto president of the United States and need to keep them sweet on me. Turns out someone's taken a really big hit of Widowan and Nipton, and there's a smoke cloud coming from beyond the yonder. On my way there, I give a knowing nod of respect to some ants so they don't come and beat me up as I encounter more raiders. Some drooling moron named Thomas runs up to me despite knowing Mr. President has anxiety around Thomas's and rightfully dies for the crime of having a bad name. An unarmed powder ganger seems to be approaching me peacefully, but like I said, it's on sight. I round the corner to see what the big dealio is. Uh oh. So this is a little horrifying, but on site does mean on site. <laughs> I like your guys' view on murdering powder gangers. What's your deal? This is Caesar's Legion. They're a military culture based on Yes. And are the major faction going against the NCR? I've played this game more times than I can count, but I've never once done a Legion playthrough because it just makes me feel bad. So Vulpix asks me to tell everybody that the Legion is full of tough dudes and I oblige, telling anyone who will listen that the Legion will beat up your dad and then crucify him. Doing so levels me up and makes me realize that if I pull the trigger harder, the bullets come out harder. How did I not think of that? After saddling up for Novak, my next stop, I walk through the Valley of Death that Coolio warned me about in the Sonic movie. After watching the Legion be incapable of beating some jerks with a cow, I arrive in good old no vacancy. I decide to get the locals warmed up to me, talk to a crazy person, donate to my local doctor. Why I even think I'll support a local business? Howdy Cliff, what do you got for me? <gasps> I don't have nearly enough money to afford this, so it looks like I'm gonna have to take up an odd job or two. Well, this fine sniper fellow could just be the ticket. I'll get money and inform where Benny and the cons went if I help out the town. They're having a problem with ghouls coming from the rocket test site, so I'm on my way, and given my one intelligence point I have over these walking corpses, I know the best course of action is to fist fight them. Unfortunately, I play dirty. The rocket test site is gonna be another dangerous dungeon. So dangerous it makes my game crash. A voice comes over the loudspeaker and tells me to head east towards the scaffolding to find a way upstairs. This is one of those times that the game does a fantastic job making you feel tense. Enemies show up on your radar well before you ever see them, so you never know when you're going to find them. The music as well and ambiance do a great job putting you on edge. It's the perfect drone that both numbs your brain and keeps you on edge the whole time. I eventually make my way where I need to get to and the game crashes. No, I can keep this up longer. Chris lets us in and immediately calls me ugly. I resist every urge of the bones in my body and talk to Jason Bright instead. He's the leader of a group of ghouls that didn't give in to madness and are trying to reach a higher plane, the hard way. They need my help repairing rockets and launching them into space. To do that, we gotta get into the basement. Bad news, basement's full of nightkin. What's a nightkin? Well, in Fallout, there are super mutants because you can't have ogres in a post-apocalyptic setting. Nightkin is what happens when a super mutant gets addicted to stealth boys. They're super irritable and constantly invisible. Unfortunately for them though, I subscribe to the spray and pray method so their invisibility is gonna do diddly squat against my shotgun. Thankfully, after the game crashes, we get down there and the Nightkin are only video game invisible, the type where you kinda have to be a little visible so you can actually tell where you're going. Good news for me is I decide to ditch the guns and fight them like a woman. They may have clubs made of rebar, but I have a pipe made of lead. After a lucky arm break, I managed to take out their leader. I'm fairly worried he might have the upper hand with a gigantic sword, but no katana. On my way out, I get so very lost, so lost I end up finding Harland, a ghoul who works with Jason as a mercenary. I cleared out all the nightkins, so he should be fine to leave, but not until I confirm that his friend is dead. This part can be really annoying since this place is a maze and you'll get turned around no matter how many breadcrumbs you leave. I eventually find her as Harland and I run back up to tell Jason the good news. Game crashes and Jason tells us that there are only two things we need to get the job done and blast off. The first is an isotope from a nearby nuclear 
earlier waste site crawling with geckos I totally would have been able to handle if the game didn't crash. Next is a thrust module, which sounds dirty. The scrapyard is where I started looking and the old lady Gibson, helpfully labeled old lady Gibson, hands them over for a reduced price because I asked. After I get it all back to Chris, the rockets are ready and I head up to the observation deck where the game crashes and we get to watch Jason and the followers take flight. Ah, I can take pride in a job well done. They didn't pay before they left. At least I get to level up and realize that holding the shotgun with both hands ups my accuracy tenfold. One final crash for the road and I go back to collect my money and my katana. All right, Cliffy B, where did, where did, where, where did you, you sold it. You sold the sword before I could get back? I'm not mad. <laughs> So it turns out the cons I'm after are nestled in Boulder City. Alrighty, I'll just make my way northward and take a right at the sign and hey, you know what? I never really finished the mission down in Prim. Yeah, they still need a sheriff and I can either get the NCR to take over, not happening, get the Powder Gangers to help, definitely not happening, or reprogram the sheriff bot to be the sheriff. I decide that out of the one options I have to go down, the best one is to let the people of Prim govern themselves under sheriff bot. I get such a hair trigger, I go to fix up the other bot in my old job, but sadly I'm not smart enough or horde enough to make that happen. All right, I'll be back later. It's time to go back, oh, shiny. Helios 1 is the combination solar array and NCR base. Now, given the fact that the NCR has the worst man who has ever lived in its ranks, I'm not inclined to do anything they want, so Mr. President dons a clever disguise in order to sneak in and get up to a little bit of trolling. Here I find Mr. Fantastic, who's having a little trouble since out of these hundred or so solar panels, only one is working. You'll never guess who the only person that can do anything about it is. Guess what? It's me. Before I can even get into the building, I need to open the door that requires me to unlock it with the terminals that the NCR has for some reason booby-trapped for their own men to, I don't know, keep them on their toes? They stored a bunch of their own dogs in here for me to kill. What is the goal? I bet that one guy suggested it. So again to the Helios control tower and proceed to learn what cheese feels like when it goes through a grater as I run into sentries, security bots, and rover brains that all seem to have heavy weapons artillery compared to my water pistol. After dying a few times, I realize that I have a gun called That Gun. I, I don't remember buying this gun. I never found this gun. Apparently it was in Cliff's store and I did sort of rob him blind after reducing his head to jam, so whatever, new, better gun. It gives me the gusto I need to go up against these robots that vastly outclass me. Mr. Gutsies are a real pain to fight, but they at least lead the way to Protectron so I can beat Senseless with my pipe. After plowing through all the scrap metal in my way, I make it to the main controls and get the option of how to distribute the energy. I could send it to the NCR, not happening, to Fremont and Westside, I don't even know what that is, to the entirety of the Mojave, or to arm a satellite cannon. Despite how nice it would be to have a giant space laser, it's not a giant space katana, so I decided to give everyone a little power as a treat. After that, I just have to wait a bit and arm the panels. Now as for how I'm going to get down. Reporting back to the lab coats and I'm on my way. No more distractions. I'm going to Boulder City and stomping a mud hole in every con I see. Boulder City is a regular anti-Mr. President convention as both the NCR and Great Cons are there in a standoff with some soldiers being held hostage. While the NCR did have an extremely rude man who tried to tell me what to do, they haven't literally shot me in the head so I suppose it's NCR o'clock. Fine, I'll get your stupid friends back, just give me a little time. I have never put any more effort into anything in my entire life than I put effort into trying to do this with stealth. I was here for 10 minutes trying to line up my body to be hiding from some soldiers and the cons as I save scummed like no one has ever scummed before, but I just couldn't get it done no matter how hard I tried. I bought a silence 22 pistol from Chet. Chet of all people just to try to get this done, but eventually the stealth option became the blunt force option as I bashed everybody's head in. Finally, I get to throw down with Jessup and get my revenge for what he did to me. I hit him so hard, I actually became one with the shotgun and can now use it more efficiently. All right, a quick crash later and now I own Jessup's smaller shotgun. It's like a shotgun, except smaller. I got the directions to Benny at the Topps Casino on the New Vegas Strip and I'm going to get him. It's a pretty uneventful walk the rest of the way, but this does give me a chance to talk about the music. 
The most music you get out of the game normally is the combat music and a little bit of ambiance in certain areas. However, you can tune your Pip-Boy into radio stations to listen to the 18 or so songs that survived the war. These songs are all iconic solely by their inclusion in this game. Play the opening notes to Big Iron and everybody can sing along. I can't or else I'll get copyright striked. A quick crash later and I'm introduced to the new brand of raiders, the Fiends. They're a lot more organized than the Powder Gangers and use energy weapons, which have a nasty habit of ignoring the properties of my armor and breaking my fragile bird bones. Oh, that does not sound good for the guy I just fired at. You After a nasty crash, I attempt to create a peace treaty between man and ant before the NCR proves yet again that one bad apple spoils the whole batch. I spend a little time murdering more fiends before coming across Psychopath Valhalla, the Gunrunner Shack. This place has any weapon you could ever dream of at your beck and call, as long as you can afford it. Unfortunately, Mr. President is strapped for cash and can't afford anything, regardless of the fact I don't even want anything since it's not a katana. Who bought the sword all the way back in Novak? I am so incredibly heartbroken. I decided to just go in the first building I could in Freeside, the town surrounding New Vegas. Uh, Mick and Ralphs fills the requirement of being a store, and I hear Mick is the gun guy around here. I go to have a talk with him. <gasps> any amount, I'll give you any amount, just hand it over! <laughs> <laughs> I have it! My hundred times folded katana from the Far East! It said that the efficacy of the weapon is proportional to the original maker, and I must say this swordsmith was probably really cool! I'm so giddy, I run around in circles till I fall asleep! There is a miner! Itsy, bitsy, tiny problem. See, to get into the strip, you need to pass a caps check of 2,000. If you have less than 2,000, you can't get in. Well, that's fine. I have over 3,000. Well, had over 3,000. Now I'm a bit short of getting in. I could sell some stuff to cover the rest, but... But then I wouldn't have it and I want it. It's mine! I decide to clear my head with a little walkabout. Uh, unfortunately, that walkabout walks me right into fiend territory. It's there I have to square off with the fiend boss, Cook Cook, who uses fire weapons. Despite having various far less skilled swordsmen on their side, Cook Cook does nearly burn me to cinders until I turn the tide with my strongest sword technique. Done. The sword is already paying for itself when I decapitate and take Cook Cook's Nog Nog. Trying to get back to my walk, though I run jaws first into a pack of wild dogs and Violet, another fiend boss. Except this time, I'm not alone, as through my scavenging, I manage to find the parts necessary to resurrect the best boy himself, Eddie! Eddie is the robot back in Prim I couldn't fix until now, and now he'll fight by my side. You can get companions in this game that will not only fight alongside you, but will also give you free perks. In Eddie's case, he lets you see enemies from way further away than you would normally. That might have something with the fact that I set my perception really low and don't want to wear glasses because they make me look stupid, but that's besides the point. I love the companions in this game. It makes you feel like you're patrolling the Mojave as a party rather than just a wanderer. With Eddie, I managed to make quick work of Violet, who finally lets me upgrade my base varmint rifle to a much better hunting rifle for long-range sniping. Well, this certainly isn't doing me any favors in terms of de-stressing, so I decide to try to continue my walk before walking golf club first into Driver Nefi. Finally, a worthy duelist, but still, all scum succumbs before my blade. Also, Eddie helped. This has to rank amongst the top eight worst walkabouts of my entire life. You know what, I think I'll just go back inside. Ah, oh, South Vegas ruins, lovely. My uncle lives here. My uncle lived here. I have impressively managed to stumble Bass Ackwards into the heart of Fiend territory with nothing but a samurai sword, but I'll be good and goddamned if I don't make a good time out of this. I then see that a majority are held up inside Vault 3. Suppose that means we just gotta kill them all. It's here that I really appreciate Eddie since he does a fantastic job covering my borderline suicidal strategy of trying to block bullets with my sword. It's down in the depths of the vault, I find a bunch of traitors locked up and being held for ransom. Unfortunately, the people who are going to pay their ransom are dead, so I gotta find the key to bust them out. But once they do, they gotta sneak out as well, and... And they just kinda do. Honestly, why didn't they just sneak out of the cage? Idiots. My job here is far from done, though, as I gotta make like the butler and clean up. In the depths of the vault is Motor Runner, Drug Kingpin, and Attic. He seems perfectly fine with talking to the gal who's butchered every single fiend on planet Earth, but is much less talkative when his head and neck aren't on speaking terms. I did it. All the fiend leaders are dead and I got a chainsaw! 
Better yet, I got plenty of money to get into Vegas. But I did drop by this medical clinic and they said they have implants that can raise my intelligence. 3,000 caps, yes siree, ma'am. Stick it in my corpus colostomy. Have a seat in the auto doc. Evening. Oh my god, I'm smart enough to realize what a mistake I just made. Okay, and broke again, whatever. I need cash, and sadly, that does mean I have to put aside my morals in the name of cash. I decided to go and ask the NCR if they need any help. Turns out they got a scientist they keep under the stairs and feed fish heads to who wants me to get some data out of a terminal on some far-off vault. Alright, sounds easy enough, but things get a little funky when the other scientist who works there tells me that I'm not the first person he sent out on this mission. There's a really good chance the last person he sent is still alive and she wants me to figure out a way to get her back. Alright, well it's a bit of a walk, but I'm sure I can- Eddie, don't make a sound. Cazadors are the worst part of this game. These guys are fast, hit hard, come in packs, and poison you with venom that can only be gotten rid of with anti-venom. If there are Cazadors in the way, understand that is code for DO NOT GO THIS WAY. Now we can make it into the vault, and from the looks of it, it's just overrun with mantises. <laughs> oh, what a relief. I mean, the hyper-accelerated flora had me a little scared, but it looks like this is gonna be real easy compared to those Cazadors. <laughs> now, I know it's kind of insulting to assume you don't already know, but I am a very brave boy. I made it through the first night of Five Nights at Freddy's 3 without even puking, so believe me when I say spore carriers are absolutely terrifying! When Fallout wants to be, it can be legitimately unnerving, and something about the spore carriers keeps me far away from this whole part of the map whenever I'm not hard up for cash, like I am now. Something about their design, how they don't have any eyes, how they don't even become hostile unless you're standing right in front of them. Here, I was standing right next to one and didn't even realize it. They're like this since the vault we're in was meant to research plants for the coming nuclear apocalypse, but eventually they mutated out of hand and turned all the inhabitants into these gross husks. Luckily, Eddie is willing to scout ahead and take care of all the scary monsters while I kind of just, uh... Hang back. You go get him, Eddie! After a lot, and I mean a lot of wandering through the halls, you seriously don't know how many times the game crashed during this part, I managed to find what I'm looking for, a data terminal with all the info the quack wanted, and the scientist the actual scientist was looking for. Except, just like I've been thinking this whole time, we can't let this place continue lest it spread out to the whole wasteland and it becomes just like this. So I venture back into the depths of hell to blow it to hell. This is incredibly hard, since igniting all the air in a given area is really hard when your body is not bomb-proof. I had to give it a few tries before I got the formula just right. I even found these weird cartridges in here, so hopefully I can put them to good use later. Before we leave, the ghoul scientist says she can't let me leave with the information I copied since it could be used for really bad things. Honey, don't worry, I don't want it anymore either. Smash this USB drive with a hammer. After a couple more crashes, I make my way back to the Freakazoid to give him a piece of my mind. And to take a few of his. <laughs> Doesn't matter, got paid. As you can see, I also managed to pick up this nifty hunting shotgun. Yeah, it can do all sorts of things. It's way stronger than my other guns, can hold more than one shot, sent me back another 2,000 caps, God damn! Okay, so I'm still not rich enough to get into town, so I gotta take up work with the Crimson Caravan Company. They're pretty weird, but Ringo finally makes good on his promise to give me the money he owes me from all the way back in Good Springs. My mission is to find and absorb Cassidy Caravans. Their arrival caravan company was wiped out, and the deed is now with the last remaining member, Cass. She's back at the NCR outpost near Nipton, so I warp over there and strike up conversation. She says she doesn't feel like trading history for money, and I remind her that if she stays here, she's liable to be told what to do, and she immediately signs. Without anything else going on, I ask if she feels like saddling up and going adventure with me, and she accepts. Before that, though, I have to get clearance for her to leave, and that ain't happening until I clear the way down back of ants so the caravans can move again. Now, I have been pretty pro-ant this whole playthrough, but I will bend my morals in the name of getting somebody else to carry all the heavy stuff I don't want to. This also lets me level up, and my disgust of spore carriers and love of the katana now allows me to do extra melee damage against abominations. Now I have Cass and Eddie in my party, which is possible since Eddie is technically a pet-type companion, therefore does not take up the usual companion slot. Not too long after leaving, Cass asks to pay her respects to the caravan wreckage, and of course, I can't say no. We go to visit and... Hey, wait a minute. If this was a raider attack, why were the bodies disintegrated? That's... weird. Cass tells us about another caravan that was hit, and yeah, it's the same story. They were all turned to dust. 
Worse yet is a map showing where they intend to hit next. We try to hightail there before something happens, but I can't fast travel with these Gazadors nearby, and that seems to have been just enough time to be late. When we get there, I- Oh, combat armor caps! I have everything I need now! I can get into Vegas no problem! Come on, anywhere! That does it. That's all I need. Crimson Caravan and the Van Graffs. Oh! Oh, all right, so before I can finally get what I want, we have to help Cass. These murders were carried out by both the Crimson Caravan and Van Graffs, who are energy weapon dealers on the Vegas Strip. Deal with the Crimson Caravan's pretty easy, since all you gotta do is shoot Alice McLafferty, the head, and peace out. No need to get all messy. Van Graffs? Well, they have the biggest stockpile of energy weapons in the wasteland, dozens of heavily armed and armored guards, and the advantage of the home field. We have a katana, though, and two people to draw fire away while I get to work. In a tactic that should not have worked while fighting about four guards, I run in and swing my sword around, and I'm so little of a threat they focus on Eddie and Cass instead. This is their downfall, as I manage to pants them and tape their clothes to my clothes to make them stronger. Once we get in there, it's super close, what with Jean trying to make my insides my outsides with a comically huge gun. But with only my sword and two much more capable people behind me, we manage to best the Van Graffs. With both our enemies dead, I go to check on Cass. Payback's a bitch, ladies. And between Gloria and Alice, hope they're in hell right now, blinking, trying to figure out where they fucked up. <sighs> yeah. Yeah, I am. Never realized I had all that anger in me. You know, when I first heard about them, I was so mad. But there was this little part of me that said, you can't do to them what they did to you. I say fuck that part. That's it. Except for one thing. Thanks. With the best boy and best girl by my side and enough money to buy Vegas, I resist the temptation to become even more of a cyborg ninja than I already am and steal everything in the Van Graaff building to sell it to make a few thousand caps. I've stuck up on ammo and new guns and I'm through messing around. It's time to go make that son of a gun eat his own shoes. Except I... I did, uh, I did get the strength upgrade and still had enough to make it into Vegas. Ooh, look at me! I'm the average person who doesn't watch Bumbles make fumbles! I'm going back to my home, which is a stinky dumpster! Vegas isn't as impressive as I'd hope it'd be, considering it kind of just looks like a crash screen. Ooh! Victor, the Securitron who I ignored for the most part, tells me that Mr. House, the head of New Vegas, wants to see me. He tells me I've been doing a bang-up job and that he wants me to get back the platinum chip from Benny. Buddy, I'm way ahead of you. On to the Topps Casino. Oh, sure, but first, a joke. What did the 12 gauge, uh, say to the face? Splat! I have to fight my way through the whole casino to get to Benny. Don't look at the fact that I could just take a simple right and get there. I've got to kill all these people. Not a single one of these executives can be allowed to live before I get my hands on that no good two bit snake. All right, fun's over. I mean it. This is happening right here, right now. The floating heads on my way to murder him certainly do not bode well for one of us. I save just before the fight and play it out in a few different scenarios. One where I kill him, another one where I kill him, one where he kills me. I don't know why I let that one happen. But eventually I end on one where I toss his unconscious body around before systematically hacking off his limbs with a hatchet. Well, Benny, it looks like you shouldn't have lost your... Head? <laughs> I've been waiting to use that one since I got shot. Probably would have hit harder if he was still alive. Anyway, the platinum whatever is mine and I can go help out Mr. House. He then shows me what the chip can do. Before I get my intelligence enhancer, I would have said you eat the chip. Now I'm wise and cool and everyone likes me. I realize the chip is clearly not something you eat. Of course, Mr. House has to butt in and show me that it can also activate the latent weapons cache hidden within every Securitron to make them a nigh unstoppable army to defend Vegas, but whatever, no one likes a show off. He tasked me with taking a trip to Cottonwood Cove to meet the Legion and secretly upgrade the Securitron base hidden underneath their base. I accept, but before I do, I go to piss on Benny's bed sheets. No, you have anger issues. On my way to do that, I accidentally stumble across this bright eyed fella. Yes, man. He's programmed to be nice to me and tell me I'm doing a good job no matter what. He lets me tell myself what to do. What to do? What to do? Wait a minute! 
I've been letting some two-bit fraud in a cheap suit tell me what to do! Oh my god, it's just like Hitler! I fell under the spell of his words! Crankly, crankly, well, that's not gonna stand, so I'm gonna march my way back up there and give this fella a talking to! Once I find out exactly where the body's hidden, I am then horribly maimed by Securitrons that I myself upgraded, but maimed does not mean killed! So I make my way down into his chambers and- Oh god, he looks like a mole rat! Face to face with him like this, I- Gosh, I just can't help but feel some biologically shocking urge telling me to beat him to death with a golf club. Caving his chest in does level me up and reminds me that I've actually known how to repair things all along and the spray of old man blood is what it took to remind me. So Mr. House is dead and the Securitrons have been pacified. I tell Yes Man the good news and bring him up to the penthouse where he uploads himself into the mainframe. For all intents and purposes, Act 1 of New Vegas is officially over and we move on to Act 2. Here we get the quest to either ally with, eliminate, or ignore the major factions of the Mojave, the Brotherhood of Steel, the Boomers, the White Glove Society, the Gamora Casino, and the Gr- Oh baby, did you mention eliminate? I recently got very into crafting my own stronger ammunition for my shotgun and put it to good use. Lucky for me, the straggler great cons on the outskirts of the base Red Rock Canyon have hunting shotguns for me to use to repair my own! I sneak just close enough to get the location on my map to fast travel there before realizing the Cassinetti stopped following me back around the first time I entered the Lucky 38 to meet Mr. House. I go back to pick them up and slip on a comically placed banana peel and to call what happens next a slaughter would be an understatement. I go to each tent one by one and make sure the only thing left of the cons is stains and a light red mist. Eventually, after ripping and tearing, it's done, and I've wiped one of my two mortal enemies off the face of the planet. Chet, I'm coming for you next. Oh man, the last two great cons. Oh, which do I kill first? Uh, is it sexist to kill the woman second, or is it right to kill the guy first? Because, like, they won't be alive to judge me, but, but this sort of stuff, like, it weighs on my content. Wait, his name is Jack? Sorry, lady. NCR is not even on my radar right now because they will be next eventually, since I gotta deal with the Wasteland's gaggle of greedy creeps. And they don't get much greedier or creepier than the Brotherhood of Steel. In every other Fallout game, they're one of the major factions that has a major impact on the story, with technology the likes of which you've never seen before. In New Vegas, they, they, they're a little scared to come out of their incredibly hard to find hidey hole in the ground, so it's like apples to apples. Way more interesting talking point is how I got there. Now, there's an incredibly easy access point if you head north of the prison the Powder Gangers were in. I decided to make things way harder though and came from the south side. What's wrong with that? Well, there's an itty bitty roadblock in every single Deathclaw that's ever been born is here. Deathclaws are the most infamous enemies in Fallout. They're super fast, hit like a pillowcase full of bricks, and however many Deathclaws you see, there are exactly three times as many that will end up fighting you. In my bullheaded stubbornness, I refuse to take an alternate route like just going around Quarry Junction, which is where all the strongest Deathclaws in the game are stationed. No, instead I decided to be a cheeky git and try to snipe them. This is a very bad idea, because unless you have the strongest gun with the strongest ammo, they will always get to you before you can kill them. I was blessed to have the two greatest meat shields in the Mojave, Cass and Eddie, to add fire to slow them down while I tried to finish them off with my shotgun. This somehow worked for a little bit. Vital to the method is that you never ever engage with more than one Deathclaw at a time. If two or God help you, three Deathclaws show up at once, you will be filled with so many holes you could legally register as a sieve. This is how attempt one ended. Attempt two goes a little better as I learned my heavy machine gun's alternate ammo does tons more damage against Deathclaws and I finally get to see inside the quarry. Cass temporarily starts seeing ghosts and tries to find them down the barrel of my gun, but I managed to hit my target anyway. I've also leveled up yet again and unlocked the final hidden art of the shotgun. This gives me a really high chance of knocking my opponent down whenever I hit them. This is my new fighting style and even works immediately since Deathclaws come from my sniping nest and I manage to stun them while Eddie takes them for a spin. Going deep enough into the quarry has us thrown down with the alpha male Deathclaw who looks like if toxic masculinity had a persona. By using all my best ammo and running scared, we actually managed to take it down. Well, if I know anything about sexual dimorphism in nature, it's that the females of the species are always the smaller ones. This should be a king- Oh, Jesus, it's Satan! So, that's the Deathclaw Mother, and it looks like if a can of power thirst had a mother's need to kill. It seems that if I want to overcome this last hurdle of my self-imposed mission, I need to think a lot more strategically. 
than ever before. I've never thought strategically. All right, so from my previous position, it's clear that they're congregated on the back wall of the west side of the quarry. If I shoot them all with a McFing gun, that should shift the power balance. I managed to steal two of their eggs before catching wind of survivors. If they've lived this long in the harshest of conditions, they must be mighty warriors like myself. I must do everything in my power to- Oh, hello, friends! Good to see you! The footage cannot convey just how many of these things I have killed. I am feeling very good about my choice to get that shotgun perk as my life is saved no less than three times in this one occasion by my precious 12-gauge shotgun. I hear tale of more enemies to the north and venture to see what they're doing and I, I, I just realized it's my bedtime, I gotta go. The funniest thing is that that side quest to get to the Brotherhood of Steel bunker is that I forgot what I was doing and just went to go do the White Glove Society quest instead. I'm not even in the door 20 seconds before they take my chainsaw and ask me to find their definitely dead son. Yes, New Vegas' most surly Brahmin Baron Heck Gunderson has lost his child somewhere in the White Glove Society's hotel and asks me to find him. I mean, look at me, I'm the model citizen. I reek of death and I love swords. Just slap a baby on board sticker on me. I still start with the staff, including Mortimer, who's so embarrassed by the occurrence that he doesn't even make any noise when he speaks. He points me to Marjorie, who is way too eager to tell me that her society does not eat people. I didn't even mention that, but she treats it like it's a goal. We here at Wendy's are happy to announce that finally, the barbecue sauce contains zero percent tar! So now that cannibalism is totally on the table, I decide to go investigate the investigator and- WHOA! Nah, that reaction sucked. Let me try again. I decide to go investigate the investigator and- WHOA! When I get the information I need off the body, some white glove cronies try and stop me, and it works great since I have no weapons and punch like a kitten. I reload my save, buy some holdout weapons that will pass security checks, and go back. <clears throat> I decide to go investigate the investigator. I gotta go get the stuff, leave myself totally vulnerable to an attack from behind. Aha! What? I go through all the trouble of buying a tiny blade and now no one will show up! Oh, well, this is just peachy. What a waste of my time! If I'm gonna get any further, I think I know what I need to do. It's disguise time! I make my way back to the kitchen since there's no way my target would ever be there. First, I have to deal with this mouthy chef by dooming him to a death worse than any shotgun could inflict. One hacking of a terminal later, which is the first time I had ever done it in the game, and hey, look at that! Heck Gunderson, stupid kid! Why was he in the freezer? Cause the white gloves are really cannibals! Well, some of them are cannibals. Mortimer is leading a ring of inner circle elites to revert to cannibalism, and I just saved them from all being flesh eaters. I even convinced Heck not to deprive the whole strip of food for the actions of the few. All right, two down, three to go. I finally decide to knuckle down and do the Brotherhood quest line I said I would. I go to find their bunker, and they have so many fake entrances and a sandstorm that's constantly brewing at night that I'm barely able to find it before knocking off for a nap. When I do get in there, they come out dressed in tin cans and asking me to turn over all my weapons and clothes. I picked a bad day to download the realistic nudity mod. We're staying in first person and never looking down. Here we meet Elder McNamara, voiced by Sasuke from Naruto. He doesn't trust outsiders, so I decide to sweeten him and his clan on me by doing a few favors. One of them includes getting an NCR Ranger to split from one of the empty bunkers. He also fits me with an explosive collar before I leave so I can't divulge where this place is. I dash over and tell the Ranger that the Powder Gangers use this place as a base and they're coming back for him. This is a lie, obviously. I extincted the Powder Gangers. He buys an airport back Namara to McNamara. He's impressed I did it without killing him, so he takes the collar off and gives me a new mission. I have to travel the globe in search of scouts they sent out who never reported back. The first is in a pit just north of the bunker, another is in a robotics museum, but the third is at Nellis Air Force Base. What's so bad about that? Well, it's just the fact that they are on a first-name basis with God and can summon down his wrath to explode half the Earth. The run to the Air Force Base is so dangerous, there's a character who wisely tries to profit off people doing their best to get there. I have to get so hydrated to withstand this assault. <laughs> When I do get to the gates, I'm allowed in for having bones that apparently cannot break. There I meet Mother Pearl, the raggedy old bag that launched howitzer shells at me and my friends. Cass is definitely standing in front of her to mimic what her head will look like after my sword gets done with her. In the proud tradition of ignoring the Brotherhood of Steel questline as long as I can, I decide to do the entire Boomer questline instead. In order to get in the good graces of the camp, I have to help out around the base. First thing I do is ingratiate myself to the youth of America. 
They're all obsessed with comic books, so I introduce them to my own creation, Captain Mr. President. She rides around in a magical rocket ship. You like La Fantoma? She's got nothing on this rocket ship. Look, you can have it. Look, little sport, you can have one too. Listen, kid, I have a lot of rockets. They're only a little radioactive. Just take the f***ing rocket, you little shit. <laughs> they worship me as their god. So now I'm good with kids. I'm also good at repairing limbs. Yeah, leg bone connected to the hip bone. I got the whole thing memorized. Let me just take a look at them. Oh, Ooh, no, oh boy, that's a, that's an ouchie. Well, have fun with that. Argyle, have you ever been in a Turkish prison? So can't help with that. So I think I'll just help with some stuff I actually know. As you know, I am a very recent master repairman, so I'm fully capable of fixing their solar panel problem. Luckily, back when I fixed, the Helio Solar Center, I managed to take a few spare parts that I can use to fix these panels lickety split. After that, I realized that the EXP points are all in my head, so I can go even further beyond and level up again! I dump every point I got into medicine, so now I don't have to lie about having experience, I just do now! After quickly reading a book about which limb goes on the shoulder and which one goes at the hips, I managed to work my newly found magic on these bodies of boomers. Once I do, they trust me enough to get their final dream off the ground. Literally! Loyal tells me about the dream of the boomers, and that's to raise a bomber plane from a lake in the middle of nowhere. Yeah, guess what? It falls on me to do it. I backwards long jump my way over there and have to deal with lake lurkers. These guys used to scare the piss out of me, but luckily I've grown up and now save my precious piss for spore carriers. After blasting tons of them away, I hold my breath really, really hard and manage to attach the Fulton extraction balloons to the plane and rise it from the lake bed. I head back and yeah, boomers will die for me. I had them on my side now and it took me less than like two missions to do it. Now that I found all their dead friends, I report back to Mickey D's and he tells me to go out and do the exact same thing, but with living people this time. All right, two of them are easy to find and the last one's pa- Come on, Mr. President, come on. You're the president. You can't be afraid. Everyone will think you're a loser and you're not a loser. You're not a loser. Eddie and Cass will leave you. You're the best. Come on, come on, mother I level up again and realize that if I hit them with the people's eyebrow, they drop their loads and their diapies. This never worked and was the worst perk I ever picked up. Last scout found and it's back on for the final mission. Their stupid hole in the ground is falling apart and I gotta fix it. All their parts are in different vaults all around the map, including the vault 22, which I made my butthole clench in fear, but luckily the part was those cartridges I found, which means I don't have to set foot in that place again. Not so lucky with the other two. I run around Vault 3 for a while before... Oh, game, stop it with these silly jokes. All right, I'll just go ahead and reload. And this is what I see. I've been putting it off, but look at how high this number's gotten. Fallout New Vegas is a lot of things, and Buggy is the first thing on that list. This game crashes so often. Sometimes it's predictable, sometimes it's not. It's the worst part of the game. I can't believe how this game is held together by slime and faith. I cannot tell you how broken this game is from words alone. The counter started as a joke, but it became very aggravating when I had to lose three hours of work, including the entire White Club, Brotherhood, and Boomer progress in my quest lines. Yeah, the last four pages, 1,595 words, all gone. <laughs> This is how the Joker was born, wasn't he? And if even a single one of you, because I know you're typing it right now, Derek, if you tell me to go download a mod to make the crashes less frequent, I did, and guess what it did? Diddly squat! Now I do have to finish the game, but if we're fighting dirty, I'm getting downright filthy. I turn on God mode, I speed myself up. You can't keep up with me! Just look at my speed! Yeah, I'm cheating, and I don't care. Please make sure to use that when I get out of it as a freakazoid. Now, speeding up the game like this did only speed up the crashing process as well, but whatever, I got through everything again, all while showing the true power Mr. President is capable of. The bunker's all patched up, but even then, that's not enough for these jerks. Now I gotta run up a hill and go fight an entire World of Warcraft raid since it's crawling with massive super mutants. That's because this is Black Mountain. Up here is a radio station ran by Tabitha and Rhonda. Well, 
Just Tabitha, really. She's amassing an army of human-hating super mutants, or just super mutants as I call them. Well, time to throw that racism back in my face since Neil is nice and wants to help me take down Black Mountain. I start running up the hill, foolishly fighting mutants twice my size and built like strategically placed fridges with a samurai sword, but it's only foolish if I lose, and I don't. I also use the Dragon's Breath slugs for my shotguns, which do a fantastic job leveling the playing field. What did, did you put a plug in his cock tube to make him explode? Cass, what the f are you talking about? As I make my way up, I have to work harder and harder to ignore the massive, beautiful guns they have that I'm just leaving behind. Eddie, <clears throat> quit your belly and get it. Hold the fourth mini gun. We're gonna make a mint. I meet Neil at the top of the mountain, and he lures most of the guards away. Luckily, he doesn't get the one with the missile launcher. Thank you so much for that, Neil. I pick the keys up underneath the stairs. I know it's there because I've played this game a lot, okay? I don't have to act like it's the first time, and I kick the door down and blow Tabitha away. I got a little lost in the sauce when mowing down Shrek's and nearly forgot what I was doing here in the first place. A Brotherhood staple! Luckily, I go to the radio tower and hook up the device the Brotherhood gave me so they can download cool toolbars quickly. So, that's the white gloves, cons, Brotherhood, and boomers dealt with, but... If I keep going this way, both the NCR and Legion will instantly be against me. I can't exactly get the stockpile of Securitrons under the Legion fort if they hate me, so I have to swallow my morals and head down to Cottonwood Cove. It's also here that I realize they're sexists! Hey! The murder, pillaging, and slave rag can excuse, but I am a woman! Hear me roar! I get face to face with Kaiser himself and try to drop a little bit of the people's eyebrow and get walloped something fierce. And you fell for that? Really? Relax. I'm fucking with you. Listen, I know he's a colossal meanie, but that's a really funny line. So after getting caught in the spell of his words, I, uh... Kinda see where he's coming from. Suddenly all that Legion talk doesn't sound like propaganda. It sounds, uh... Sounds pretty right, honestly? <laughs> nah, I upgrade the Securitrons, keep the Brotherhood and Boomers on my side, and tell that wrinkly old bag of f to suck a lemon. I go to see the Omuertas at Gomorrah and literally walk out after looking in. I don't want to do that quest line, and I report back to Yes Man to tell him everything's in place. He tells me an assassination attempt will be carried out on the president, and I know I have to spring into action to save my. Oh. The phony baloney NCR president. Yeah, be my guest, blow him to high heaven. Now that I'm going down this path, however, I'm marked as an enemy of both the NCR and the Legion. Now, the easy thing to do would be to haul myself to the El Dorado substation, power on the Securitrons, and march for the final mission at the dam, but... Why should I, when instead, I can take a piece out of the game before it's even played? I head back to Cottonwood Cove and with a new and improved sniper rifle, turn New Vegas back into the point-and-click adventure game it was with Fallouts 1 and 2. I snipe every legionary in the cove, free the slaves, and take myself back to the fort. I realize these guys aren't good enough for my shotgun and going katanas a -blazing. Once we get into the thick of it, I realize that the one thing I forgot to pack before my murder quest was any amount of healing items. I have to drug myself loopy just to get into Kaisar's tent. I mean, I don't even know what half this stuff does, but if it's got a needle, it's going to my body. I lure them outside and just start shooting. I eventually stop shooting, but that's only after the body stopped moving. I did it. The brain of Caesar's Legion has been killed and has been established time and time again throughout the whole storyline. The Legion is nothing without Kaisar. Once Kaisar is dead, the Legion will have no one good enough to lead them and is doomed to fail. I take a celebratory sit on Caesar's big chair before dumping his clothes and weapons to be forgotten in a dusty display case to afford the mother of all shotguns, the Riot Shotgun. It's got a drum magazine, which means I don't have to spend the best days of my life reloading, and it's all at once, and it's a mammoth of a gun, too. It also loses 4,000 caps of value the second Mr. President touches it. Now I'm ready to handle the substation I need to get into in order to boot up my private army. The NCR rangers in the way are little more than fleshy water balloons before the wrath of my boomstick. After stocking up, it's me, Eddie, and Cass against two armies at the same time. The final assault on Hoover Dam is an absolute nightmare, especially when that massive army I got together now consists of a single normal Securitron who can die. 
It's the first time in the game I've actually needed to use cover just to survive, and it lets you get to vantage points like the tops of watchtowers in order to pick off some guys from long range in order to make the path a little clearer. I get into an epic high-stakes sniper duel where the other sniper does not even know I exist. It's high school all over again! Please enjoy my PowerPoint presentation on Fallout New Vegas. The frame rate is not chugging, it's drowning. Thankfully, the boomers finally came through for me and bombed the heck out of the dam, somehow not breaking it. The way forward is clear, but first, I gotta get into the dam itself. After fighting through the best and brightest the NCR has to offer, I get the choice to either blow up the dam or finally blast my Securitrons with full power. Seems like there's only one real option for me at this point, so Mr. President wakes up her cabinet. One last crash for old time's sake and we're at the end of the road. What should be a massive pain is a cakewalk when massive hulking robo-death dealers cash out the legionaries in your way to their final stronghold. This is going to be a tough one though, since on my way here I used up every single stim pack, drug, and bottle of water I have to heal myself. One final wave of the strongest legionaries in the game... <sighs> Sorry guy, I... I got a nap. I'm done being tuckered out, I wanna be murder. It's the head of the Legion, Caesar's crown jewel, Legate Lanius. There's a really interesting and full dialogue tree here where you slowly convince Lanius that conquering Nevada is a terrible idea as they would just be copying the mistakes of the NCR and leave their original colonies open to insurrection. Sadly, my speech isn't high enough to deal the finishing blow without fighting. It and my karma, though, are high enough to convince Lanius that he is so strong he could take me on one-on-one. -on -one. Ah, uh, yes. Mano a mano. A duel to the death! Alright, Cass, Eddie, get him! This speech check does give me the last bit of experience I need for my final level up, which gives me Super Slam. A property like my shotgun perk that knocks people over, but for my melee weapons! Seeing as Lanius uses the Blade of the East, I decide to meet him. I have been waiting for a swordsman to match me all along, and it's finally here! I briefly sent him to hell before recognizing that his sword is a, a little stronger than mine and does the same knockdown trick. Like the Catholics of Venezuela lying and saying that Capybara was a fish during Lent that really happened, look it up, I decide shotguns are a sort of sword if you think about it. Don't think about it. Combining the shotgun and Katana's rate of fire and knockdown properties, I actually managed to stunlock Lanius to the point that he gives up and tries running away from me. He delivers an almighty brap that sends me flying backwards 20 feet, and that's enough to level up. Okay, I'm splicing clips together to not show how many times I died in this fight. Sue me. I don't think this is an honorable end for the Legate to be kicked around like a tin can on the streets, but you can't say that him and every legionary windbag doesn't deserve it. Finally, it's all done. I'm ready to go home and kick my feet up and- <laughs> And a how do you do to you too, General Oliver? Meet my funny friends! Sir, thank you for showing up, but as I see, you don't have a president anymore. Meanwhile, Mr. President is right here. Get going. The final chat of this game is basically your victory lap on this geek. He gets real quiet once I tell him I have the boomers on speed down, they can reduce him and his army to nothing but folk tales. Do you know what you're doing? Making a nation like you think you're doing ain't like chowing down on a pile of fancy lad snack cakes. Geez, General, given the sorry state of this place, I'd say you couldn't do much better. Oliver takes his best shot at the president with one last second insult, and I send Yes Man to kick him in the nuts until he flies off like Goofy. Yes Man tells me he's off to go become more assertive, and that leaves us with the independence ending of New Vegas. There are four major endings. NCR, Legion, House, and this one, and I'd say it's about my favorite to get. The idea of people getting to choose for themselves is what sits best with me. The game ends with the final narration by series vet Ron Perlman and a recap of all the factions that I met and where they ended up. I have some regrets about people I didn't help enough, a good hearty chuckle at the people I wiped out, and walked back into the wastelands. Probably just looking for a cozy bed and some slippers because it has been one heck of a weekend. I got work in the morning. So that was New Vegas. Enough cannot be said about how this game is an absolute blast beginning to end. Save for the times where the game rebels against me and decides I'm done playing, I can't find much fault with it. Do I wish that the Legion wasn't planning on tearing down the rec center evil? Sure. Do I wish the game had additional time and money put into it so all the content that was cut out could be put in? 
duh. At the end of the day, though, I feel like New Vegas, as it is, is just this crystalline perfect game that does everything it sets out to do perfectly. Combat, story, dialogues, environment, sound, it's all such just a perfect package given what strict restrictions the game was made under. What I showed you is barely even all the game has to offer. So many locations and quests left ignored or killed, and I didn't even touch the mods. Modding extends your playtime at least a couple of playthroughs. So do the game's four major DLCs, which... Well, let's just say Mr. President isn't done wandering just yet. 